Hello! My name is Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Welcome to another archaeogastronomical adventure. And this time, I'm going to make you travel with me down to the Eastern Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean in general, where we will explore some strange Mediterranean flavors, some spices from the ancient Mediterranean world, but also extremely popular nowadays and widespread, I would say, to our modern cooking, which is uh, rather interesting. And it's very, very fascinating to find out the origins of these um, ingredients. While by no means um, unknown, I think they deserve a lot more recognition and a lot more use in our cuisine. Uh, now, okay, some of one of them is quite difficult to find here, but if you go to good uh, Greek delicatessens, I'm sure they will uh, sell it. The others are far more widespread, but um, yeah, I urge you to find them in good spice shops or some uh, Middle Eastern supermarkets. They will have far better and fresher quality. And as with all herbs and spices, the fresher it is, obviously the better it is, and use it as soon as you open it. Uh, so yeah, my advice with spices and herbs is always don't buy huge quantities, rather buy small quantities that you can use them and they won't lose their potency. Okay, so off we go to our first uh, little mysterious ingredient. Mastic. Masticha in Greek. Mastic is one of the names given to the droplets, to the resinous droplets of a gum that flows from the wounds of the cultivated Pistachia lentiscus variation chia, a tree which is a close relative of the tree that yields uh, the pistachio nuts. Now Masticha is very, very prominent and very famous uh, in Greece, obviously, but it's very... The island of Chios is very famous for, for, for Masticha. In fact, it's considered the only place that has a proper uh, Masticha. Uh, so we have a very specific and distinctive uh, terroir here. Uh, the sweetest resinous gum and the most fragrant one comes from the Greek island of Chios or Chios in uh, the Aegean Sea. There, the clear nectar-like resin that weeps from the wounds inflicted on the leafy shrub-like tree is called the Tears of Hios, and is carefully harvested and dried into a hard and translucent mass that looks like peanut brittle. This masticha is cultivated since the ancient times. Uh, so ancient Greeks, at least from the time of Herodotus, so around the 4th, maybe 5th century BC, we have mentions of masticha from the island of Hios, the ancient Greeks using it, using it uh, as a chewing gum. And etymologically, if you think about it, the word uh, masticated, which means chewing in a sense, comes from the Greek word masticha. So the English term mastic is borrowed from the Greek word masticha. And the both, obviously the Greek is coming, I guess, from the Phoenician word uh, mastichan, to chew. So yeah, it was used as an uh, ancient form of chewing gum to clean um, the teeth for, as a breath freshener and also had various other uses throughout the millennia that's been uh, cultivated, uh, such as a perfume, a varnish, a medicine, and uh, it's been made very digestive for at least uh, 2,400 years. Over time, Mediterranean cultures identified additional culinary and endological uses. So it's been used in uh, wines and other alcoholic beverages for this versatile gum. So today, most of the Kios production is used in liquors and pastries and candies. Now, also the tree can be found uh, throughout the Mediterranean uh, basin and in ma and it's many different islands. Now, this uh, beautiful raisins gum only comes from the island of Kios. In fact, there are also some uh, Lebanese that they also do have some trees so the Lebanese cultiv cultivate the same species, for, but they use it for its nut-like fruits to flavor sausages. And they use the mastic as well, apparently. But um, 
legally they cannot sell it as mastic, and the taste is different. The terroir is not the same. And there is also a Bombay mastic harvested from uh, another tree of the genus Pistachia. So mastic is an essential ingredient in many anise-flavored distilled beverages, including the Greek ouzo and the Turkish and Cretan raki. In addition to using masticha in their own ouzo, the residents of Chios also make a sweet-smelling liquor called mastichato. The Greeks also use masticha in two refreshing summertime drinks, one called sumada, a mix of mastic, cane sugar, almond milk, and the potted liquor chipuru, and another summertime drink, which we used to have a lot um, as uh, kids in my family, and throughout Greece, I think, uh, up until recently, I guess. I don't know if people still do that. It's called a hippovrichio, which means submarine, which consists of mastic, honey, and cold water. Basically, mainly mastic. Honey is very rare, but mainly a teaspoon or a tablespoon full of uh, mastic um, um, mass and in, dipped in cold water, in iced water. And basically, you eat that as a sweet, refreshing drink. Obviously, the best thing is uh, the liquor masticha, masticha liquor that is made um, with the flavoring. Uh, but if you're not drinking, if you're not, um, if, you, if you're a teetotaler, then um, you can sample masticha in uh, some of the famous confections called uh, lukumia or Turkish lukum, the Turkish delight, which is found uh, throughout the Middle East. Mastic is also used to flavor um, and thicken. Puddings, candies, sweet pastries, ice creams, jams, and even cheeses. And it can be rubbed uh, for baked or fried poultry and seafood to give them a distinctive crust. Even though those um, uses sound quite secular. There is also, uh, in the Greek Orthodox faith, uh, there are many feasts and fasting days that celebrate um, and they use Masticha as a frankincense. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of food, um, f- food-wise as well, it's been used uh, in uh, festival breads such as Vasilopita. And it's also the key ingredient of a very interesting um, lamb and a chickpea stew from, uh, from Hu Zhu Hui, I think a Chinese or Mongolian um, writer who recommended that to his Mongolian emperor. And it's been recorded as um, a soup for the Khan, one of the classic mo- food history of the Silk Roads. The tree, the masticha tree in Greek, called Skinos, and generally can be found in just 24 villages in the southern part of the island of Chios. They are called Mastichochoria, and they are also recognized by the, by the EU as a PDO, so the, the product is protected designation of origin. And it's so specific. I mean, just the southern part of the island in only 24 villages. They've tried to cultivate it in the north part of the island, but they didn't succeed. They transplanted some trees from the south of the island to the north and didn't happen. It seems like the, the southern hilly part, which uh, gives has a distinctive climate that is mild in the winter and dry in the summer, it gives, uh, it gives them the, the masticha raisin the qualities to dry and harden properly and acquire the taste that it has. And the rain is important to to not come early in the summer or early in the autumn because it means we wash the harvest away. Of course, uh, from the ancient times, masticha was a valuable commodity, as valuable as uh, diamonds, apparently. And um, yeah, it's been cultivated and uh, used uh, and provided a big uh, salary for the Byzantine emperors uh, back in the medieval times and Middle Ages, as um, it was a very exclusive uh, product only grown in in this part of the world. Also, subsequent conquerors like the Genoese and the Turkish and the Ottomans, they obviously took care to (laughs) protect the trade of this product and the cultivation and the growing of uh, the trees. And this is my little story for Masticha. Uh, do try and find it. I'll post some links on my Patreon page and on uh, Acast, so you can follow and find um, how it looks, where you can find it, and so on. And exclusively for my Patreon buckets only, I will have some recipes with Masticha and with the other spices we're going to check out now. 
Today's episode comes with the welcome support of Malby and Greek, the number one delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce from all the wild corners of Greece and with products from small artisanal producers. So why not try today some of the Malby and Greek's amazing early harvest extra virgin olive oil, their own one, which I find fantastically delicious, and um, some six-month barrel-aged feta cheese from uh, Costarellos, and uh, some of the double-baked barley rusts from Kithira, and of course, the wild Cretan oregano. Very few ingredients, very simple ingredients, but together the combination is exquisite. So what I do is take a barley rusk, put a bit of feta cheese, drizzle with a bit of olive oil, and I sprinkle it with a bit of oregano. And this is simple yet super delicious starter for anyone. Anyone will eat it and enjoy it. This is something I swear by. Try it and you won't regret it. Malbin Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. You can buy the exquisite goods online at malbiandgreek.com or if you go to the shop in Bermondsey, Lucy Way. And of course, for you, dear listeners, there is a 15% discount if you buy online with the code DELICIOUS. Enjoy! Sesame. Sesame, obviously, is not a very forgotten plant and it's not really... Yeah, it's vastly used uh, by many, many different um, civilizations and cuisines. And we associate a lot with the Chinese, um, I suppose, with Chinese culture and cuisine nowadays. But sesame seeds and sesame uh, has been used for thousands of years. The oldest sesame seeds found in archaeological context uh, come from the Indus Valley, uh, the site called Harappa, which is now in Pakistan, and they date back 4,000 to 4,600 years. And this discovery appears to indicate that uh, the sesame was first domesticated uh, more than four and a half millennia ago, somewhere there in the Indian subcontinent, I suppose, and probably spread from there towards the Mesopotamia within uh, 500 years. Most of the wild relatives of sesame are found in Africa, but only one particular wild ancestor, uh, the S. orientale variation Malabaricum, is restricted to the Indian subcontinent. And hence from here we have this um, travel, traveling uh, route of the of the of the of the seed. Sesame seeds were pressed into the only oil used by the Babylonians and reached the Egyptians by 1,500 BCE. By 200 BCE, the sesame started to be to grow in China, and it's been there long enough to become a, a prevalent crop. There are many Chinese varieties uh, which uh, spread westwards into Central Asia along the Silk Roads. And black sesame seeds caught many forms of sushi in Japan and, of course, uh, anywhere else that makes sushi. The raw or toasted seeds of of, uh, the sesamum indicum offer a pleasantly sharp, somewhat nutty flavor that uh, favors their use as both a spice and a cooking oil. In fact, the seeds are 60% oil by weight, and the sesame plant may be the source of the world's first cultivated oil seed, as I said, having been domesticated in the Indian subcontinent well before any written records in Eurasian and African civilizations. Uh, The sesame plant is an annual herb with lovely tubular flowers, and it produces a small teardrop-shaped seed that comes in all shades of white, pale red, brown, beige and dead black. Sesame seeds um, came out of the Malabar coast to reach Mesopotamia during the early Bronze Age and they were known as Taila or Tila, which is a generic term in ancient Sanskrit that was used in northern India to refer to the oiliness of any seed. Along the same line, the Akkadian term Samasamu means oily or fatty seed. The later, the later related Assyrian term, Shaman Shami, may have given rise to the Aramaic Shumshema, also written as Shumshem, the ancient Arabic as Sam, and the modern Arabic as Simsim. The Hebrew term Shumsum is similar, all connote oily seeds. And you can see from all of them the, the, the root of the word sesame, right? Today's modern Persian congeed is derived from the from the Middle Persian, 
which may have its roots into the classic Armenian uh, word Kunkut or the Turkish on the Turkic Kunji. And then there's a related Hindi word Gingi, which may echo the rattle of the seeds in the dried capsules. In the eastern reaches of its historical range, the Chinese term Hu Ma or foreign hemp and uh, Jima or oily hemp have long been used. The nuttiness of the tiny wafer-like seeds is intensified by toasting and there are sesame oils for those who enjoy that intensity and those who do not. The oil pressed from the untoasted seeds is pale but fragrant and is good for baking and for stir-frying and other high heat cooking because of, because it has a high smoke point. Toasted sesame oil, which is amber, it has a robust flavor and it's ideal for dressing salads or for adding to already cooked dishes. And definitely don't use it for frying as it has a very low smoke point. And there is a third oil product from the sesame uh, as a viscous paste known as amsimsim bitahini in the Arabic speaking world. And of course, anywhere else is known as tahini, uh, this thick spreadable paste that um, we use in many desserts or in sauces, especially in the Lebanese, in the Lebanese world, which they use it as a, as a sauce. So they whip tahini with lemon juice to coat some fish when frying, and um, they can make a delicious candy from toasted sesame seeds mixed with caramelized sugar, and so on. Crushed and sweetened sesame seeds are used for making another kind of paste, that is dried and hardened into the popular confectionery known as halva from Eastern Anatolia through Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine. And uh, yeah, there's basically similar, similar sweets made with sesame in Egypt throughout North Africa, from Egypt to Morocco and Greece, of course. Now, the third and final uh, spice I want to talk to you about today is the more or less ubiquitous nowadays uh, sumac or sumaki, uh, as we know it in Greek. And this is really, really popular because it's um, a spice that's used in uh, the Lebanese cuisine and generally Middle Eastern cuisines a lot. I think it's become popular through uh, Lebanon, Palestine and Syrian cuisine. And yeah, generally, that's where, where it's used uh, nowadays a lot. But it has been used in antiquity, in ancient Greece, uh, for uh, as as a as a spice actually and uh, as a medicine, and it was very popular in the cuisine of the Athenian citizens. And we definitely have uh, references um, all the way, I think, back uh, from Solon, the ancient Athenian statesman. So, what is this um, lemony tangy uh, zingy powder called sumac? It's basically made from the burgundy red berry-like fruits of uh, the tree called Rus coriaria and they do offer a very bright and tangy and mouth puckering punch up and um, that um, flavor profile follow it, it's followed by uh, notes of sweetness and tartness and a bit of saltiness the sumac fruits from the tree Rus as we said um, they are typically grow in cone-shaped clusters which deepen in, uh, in the color as um, the autumn comes. Each berry has a thin outer skin that uh, surrounds seeds so hard that they often need to be soaked before grinding them into a coarse powder. Uh, sumac, the tree is cultivated more or less in a big area in the west world, uh, from westwards from Afghanistan, across the Middle East and the Mediterranean, and as far as the Canary Islands. And the spice, sumac the spice, or... Simak in the Levantine Arabic is sold already ground and basically that you dust it on skewered meats immediately before grilling. You generally need a, a little bit, only a scatter of sumak to get that distinctive color and that lemony zinc. In Iran and parts of Turkey, Lebanon and Syria, sumak is among the primary spices used in rubs for all sorts of grilled and baked meats, fish and birds. In some places, through an not all. The Zatar spice makes you that you find uh, sumac plays a big role in there too. Up to a few years ago, we weren't able to find um, sumac or nice sumac around around the, the UK's um, supermarkets. But I, I think nowadays uh, this is um, a problem long gone. And that's it. And this is uh, the little episode today about some unknown spices from uh, the Eastern Mediterranean world. I hope you enjoyed it 
And um, if you follow me on Patreon, you'll get uh, a couple of recipes bonus in there, in that podcast, using the aforementioned ingredients. Don't forget to subscribe and support The Delicious Legacy on Patreon. Just search Patreon and The Delicious Legacy podcast to find out how. And um, I would like to shout out to all my oldest patrons, Pi R Squared, Alana Salvador, Yana, John Gorner, Kat, Kyle Glover, Michael Sanfardino, Steve Holloway, Leah Potts, Lauren Gaither, Dimitris, Christopher Banks, Dwight Brown, Zane Epti, Philly Eropoulos, Stereos Hadzikiriakidis, Andrew Cabanis, Guy Joyner, Andrew Kenrick, Tom Eagle, Mark Knight, Damian Bell, and Paul Cooper. And now for the extra bit for Patreon backers only, the recipe for lamb and chickpea stew. These ancient dishes have uh, emerged at different times in multiple places, and it's clearly spread uh, uh, with the Arab and Persian influence as far east as Mongolia. And also, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next episode, which is going to be about um, another precious ancient herb and spice. So stay tuned. My name is Thomas Dinas, and this has been the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Enjoy! Enjoy!